Margaret Thatcher was elected to office with a mandate to curb union power. In doing so, Mrs. Thatcher would provoke anger and outrage, most notably during her second term in office, when confrontation first with the miners and later with the print unions would give way to scenes of violence and civil disorder little seen in peacetime Britain. The unions would never be the same. But how did reform turn into conflict and all-out war? Mrs. Thatcher's attitude to the trade unions had been hardened by Edward Heath's battle with the coal miners that resulted in his election defeat in 1974. Then, as leader of the opposition, she witnessed the failure of the Labour government to influence the unions, leading to further strikes and the winter of discontent. What sort of government is it which sees its authority passed to strike committees? You will perhaps have noticed the speed and efficiency with which some of those pickets went into action. They seemed to know somehow exactly which factories to go to, to cause maximum dislocation. Determined to avoid a repeat the following year, Mrs. Thatcher set about sorting out the unions. Over five years, three bills containing union legislation were introduced by three different employment ministers, Jim Pryor, Norman Tebbit and Tom King. To be Secretary of State for Employment under Mrs. Thatcher was to be under constant pressure, rather like a racehorse. Uh, she wanted to go faster than they, and that was Jim Pryor and Norman Tebbit, thought was wise. And I think the success of the government's trade union approach was a combination of this fierce jockey and the astute horses that were riding the policy. Uh, but she always wanted to go faster than they did. While Mrs. Thatcher was driving forward her policy for union law reform, the seeds for the miners' strike were being sown with the election of left-winger Arthur Scargill as president of the National Union of Mine Workers in December 1981. We want leadership in this union. We don't want leaders who come out of negotiations halfway through and say to the waiting press, I don't believe there's any more available before we've had a chance to go back in. I think Scargill was somebody who was um, probably a genuinely sincere Marxist. I mean, when I read all of his past lectures and all of his past speeches, there was this enormous consistency that you know, the world was going to be a better place when the Marxist revolution took place. And for example, he campaigned for unions not to accept for their workers profit sharing because he said profit sharing will make the workers like capitalism. And we don't want the workers to start to like capitalism. We'll never defeat capitalism if they like capitalism. And things like that, which were, you know, passionately believed. Earlier in 1981, before Scargill's election, a miners' strike over possible pit closures and redundancies had been averted by what was portrayed as a government climb down and a victory for the miners. She decided basically to give in to the miners in the beginning of 1981 for their demands. They were trying to resist uh, closures. It was a big closure program. And Mrs. Thatcher, of course, wanted the closure program because the coal mines were costing absolutely ludicrous amount to the Exchequer. But she gave in. And the reason she gave in is she wasn't ready. The trade union laws weren't ready, nor were the coal stocks ready, nor were the probably the state of the police. And um, she knew that she had to do that uh, and then she was ready next time round. Although pit closures had been temporarily shelved, it was apparent that the national coal industry was in decline and collieries would have to close. It was also clear to Mrs Thatcher that Arthur Scargill would mount a challenge to the government. I, mean, I was asked to do the job at Energy because of the emerging Scargill position. I mean, Margaret Thatcher phoned me and said, Peter, I want you to go to Energy. Um, because, as you know, Mr Scargill will undoubtedly try and get a strike. 
because he had tried on about eight occasions in the last Parliament and had never obtained it because the miners' union had never had a strike without a ballot. And every time he was defeated in the miners' ballot. And she said, I'm sure he will keep on trying. And if he does, it will be a very serious part of this life of this government. She left North London bound for a triumphant reception at Conservative Party headquarters. Mrs Thatcher did not have to wait long. After her victory in June 1983, the sabre rattling began. Arthur Scargill was quick to condemn the result as the worst national disaster for a hundred years. Margaret Thatcher's first visit to any government department after a re-election as Prime Minister was the Department of Energy to try to find out how to live with Arthur Scargill. She knew what was coming. And if it had been a Labour government that had been elected in 1979, the Prime Minister of the time would have, should have gone to the Department of Energy and said, how do I live with Arthur Scargill? Because he was quite impartial in his contempt for government. He was an old-fashioned uh, revolutionary, really, and he was determined to get rid of the government uh, to the greater glory, as he saw it in the miners, who would have a job for life until the last nut of curl had been removed from a pit, regardless of whether it was economic or not. But Mrs Thatcher was now not just confident of her cause, she was confident of support in the country. She had already brought in Ian McGregor to head up the National Coal Board. It was his job to draw up plans to save money, close pits and scrap jobs. He had been a brilliantly successful American industrialist and he had settled a number of big strikes there. And he was put in, first of all, to steel. And he was chairman of the steel board and there was a strike and it was settled you know, after a few months. Um, and so I think he felt that, you know, against Scargill, he'd have a tough in American industrialist who would deal with it. During the second half of 1983, relations between management and union deteriorated. In October, the NUM agreed a ban on overtime in protest at the coal board's latest pay offer and at prospective pit closures. We have asked them to reconsider their position because it seems to me to be a very belligerent attitude on the part of the board and its chairman to terminate at this stage negotiations after any purpose um, which could have been served by developing the matters that we've put on the table today uh, was not pursued. Our sales are the controlling factor in this business. We just can't continue to produce coal and stack it up in order to please all of the people who want to continue to produce coal without a market. In December, McGregor brought forward plans to cut the workforce by 20,000 and close around 20 pits. Discussions were held with the NUM, but it was immediately clear they were unlikely to succeed. I think it's confirmation that Mr McGregor intends to butcher this industry in the same way that he did with British Steel and British Leyland. There can be no doubt that his declared intention today to reduce the output level by some 8 million tonnes means the closure of, of between 20 and 40 pits and the possible loss of between 20 and 40,000 jobs. It was now clear that a strike was inevitable. But the government expected that Scargill would hold a national strike ballot first and there were hopes that most miners would be bought off by the cash being offered. Arthur Scargill, however, used the union rule book to avoid it. The biggest regret I've got is that I didn't follow, follow my instincts around about Easter time in 1984 and call publicly and directly for a ballot of NUM members in order to determine whether there should be a strike or not. The great mistake of um, Neil Kinnock, who had by now become leader of the Labour Party in succession to Michael Foote, was that he never denounced the lack of a ballot. He wanted to, I think. There were moments when he came near to saying he couldn't go on strike without a ballot. He never actually said it. I thought that the change in NUM rules that Arthur Scargill had, in my view, rightly secured, meant inevitably that those new rules, perfectly democratic rules,